The first month of 2022 is coming to a close, and what do we have to show for it? Sub-zero temperatures and confusion over mask mandates, among other things. Oh yeah, and we're still in a pandemic. But also, maybe there's a little light at the end of the Omicron surge, with the first news of a drop in hospitalizations around the region since November. And we're pretty excited for the kickoff of the Times Union's annual Best Of nominations. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the week's top headlines. Per my preliminary investigation, it was one of those cases where the use of force was simply unavoidable. We'll talk to New York State Public Radio's Karen DeWitt about some of the challenges and experiences she's faced as a female reporter at the Capitol. And one of the first things that I was told when I got here by one of the older women who worked here, that there was one assemblyman that she said, watch out for him. If he comes after you, go hide in the women's bathroom. And we'll chat with actress and Slingerland's native Kelly Curran, who stars in the new HBO series, The Gilded Age. You know, when I first learned that we'd be filming some of the show in Troy, I was so excited because it it felt very full circle. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. Let's kick things off with a roundup of what appeared this week in the Times Union and on timesunion.com. All right, we're back this week. We're going to talk about the top headlines with Times Union Editor-in-Chief Casey Seiler. Let's start here with the mask mandate. Uh, This week, a judge in Long Island ruled it unconstitutional, and that led to a chain of events that resulted in, you know, among many other things, uh, confusion and tension, uh, especially at the local level and particularly at a local school district. So, Can you tell us more about the fallout from this? Yeah, and this is a a case that, as we're speaking, midday on Thursday, is still, you know, very much in process. Basically, as you noted, a a Long Island state Supreme Court judge knocked down Kathy Hochul's mask mandate, basically not, not so much saying it's illegal on its face, but that since it wasn't enacted with legislative support, that makes it problematic. In other words, the health department, in specific the health commissioner, who is a defendant in the case, uh, was overstepping her powers by, um, along with the governor, imposing the mask mandate. Now, an appellate judge the next day, I believe, you know, heard this case and basically left the mandate standing until a larger panel of appellate justices can hear arguments on both sides. That is scheduled to happen Friday. And uh, it is likely that unless it goes up to the State Court of Appeals, which is, of course, the highest court in the state, and I think there is some confusion over the fact that the Supreme Court in New York, while it's got a fancy name, is in fact sort of the lowest level of state court, at least, to hear these cases. The Court of Appeals is the biggest case. It could go all the way up there. One imagines it will happen very quickly. Of course, the mass mandate was scheduled to expire at the end of the month, but it's causing great confusion. And Wendy Libertor did a story that appeared in print on Thursday, just noting that for school officials, for principals, for teachers, what you're getting is a lot of, or maybe not a lot, but some furious parents who are saying, you can't force my kid to wear a mask. It's illegal. The courts have ruled and, you know, overlooking the fact that that essentially the the initial Long Island judge's action is, at least as we speak, held in abeyance. So certainly we'll be watching that ongoing situation. Um, All right. Moving on to the death of former longtime New York State Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, who one could argue at the height of his career was one of the most powerful people in New York State. Uh, Now, he was in prison at the time, right? Can you tell us uh, about the circumstances? Yeah, and you wouldn't have to argue very hard that he was, for two decades, one of the three most powerful people in New York State government. As 
the assembly speaker beginning in 1994. Now, the circumstances of Silver's fall are, you know, of course, well documented in 2015, just about exactly six years ago, he was um, arrested to face a range of corruption charges related to what prosecutors said were two schemes to enrich himself through uh, different elements of his legal practice, and that he was essentially uh, directing clients, um, some of them with uh, business before state government, towards law firms in which he had a financial stake. He appealed it. He was tried twice, and then after his second conviction, appealed his sentence. And it went on and on and on until he was finally sent to prison initially at Otisville. He got out briefly last year, but was swiftly returned to prison. He came very close to getting his sentence commuted by President Trump in the the waning days of the Trump administration, but didn't get it. And finally died uh, Monday, age 77, in a federal medical center prison in Massachusetts. Yes, he certainly didn't go out on a high note there. Uh, Moving on to Albany. An Albany City police officer uh, shot someone this week. Uh, What was the circumstance there? What was the situation? Yeah, so this was a really unfortunate case. Early Monday morning, police responding to a call encountered a man who was in the street just a couple of blocks from Albany Medical Center. Two officers got out of the car. This young man, Jordan Young, 32 years old, had a knife. He was in the street with a dog. The police did not know what was up, but they told him to drop the knife, obviously. And first, as described by Police Chief Eric Hawkins right after the incident, and then on Thursday, as shown in body cam video from each of the officers that was shown at a subsequent press conference. Put it down. Drop the knife. Mr. Young ran at one of the officers who backed up a few steps as he was coming at him. And then um, shot him several times in the torso. He was subsequently taken to Albany Medical Center, which, again, is just a couple of blocks away, where he remains in critical condition. You know, this was an officer that was under attack. And uh, this was in, in, not just under attack, but under a deadly, a deadly force attack. And, um, and the officer, in, in my opinion, took the necessary actions in order to protect himself at the point. So- and Chief Hawkins said, uh, or has said repeatedly since this incident occurred, that to him, this appears to be a justified shooting, that these officers were under threat from somebody with a deadly weapon, and that shooting in this case was appropriate. Of course, those who have been critical of police tactics, while certainly in no way justifying the fact that these officers were apparently placed in peril, have said that it points up the need for better uh, training in de-escalation, potentially. And, uh, you know, they've questioned why were the officers not able to use tasers rather than only have the option of, of using firearms against him. It would appear, based on the video that was shown on Thursday, that it does comport with the way that Chief Hawkins has been describing the scene in previous um, appearances before the press. All right, you can see that video at timesunion.com. Finally, the Best of nominations have opened. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, our annual rundown. We need your help for uh, nominations. Uh, If you go to timesunion.com through February 4th, you can offer up nominations of what you consider to be the best. Um, Once those nominations are tallied up, voting for the, the top five in each category is going to run from February 21st through March 4th. And then we will have the final vote on dozens of categories ranging from, you know, best pizza to best plumber to best bank or credit union, you know, on and on and on. It's it's a lot of fun. People really get into it. Goodness knows that the businesses who want to be selected are way into it as well. So we encourage everyone to 
as they used to say in Albany political precincts, vote early and vote often. Truly, and I am not joking, this is one of the most exciting times of the year for us. (laughs) All right, Casey, thank you so much. We will check back in with you next week. Yes, thanks a lot. As always, you can read more about all of the stories and the issues that we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com. Okay, if you live in New York and you listen to public radio, you've likely heard the voice of Karen DeWitt. She's been delivering reports of the daily happenings at the state capitol in Albany for more than three decades. When she started out as a cub reporter during the Mario Cuomo administration of the late 80s, early 90s, she was one of only a handful of women in what you could call a man's world. So much a man's world, she says, that there was a secret urinal in the Legislative Correspondence Association office. I sat in the downstairs part of the large cavernous um, Legislative Correspondence Association uh, press room. They gave me the littlest desk, because, you know, I was new. (laughs) And um, at the end of the room where I sat, there was a door. And I would see the men go in that door and out of that door. I would hear a toilet flush. And I came to realize that the men had a bathroom right inside the LCA press room. Today, after a tumultuous and historic year in state government, New York now has its first female governor. And the pool of reporters at the Legislative Correspondents Association has far more members now who identify as female. Karen DeWitt's recounting of her early experiences versus what she says it's like in the Capitol press court today is simply fascinating to me. So I asked her to tell me more. I want to confirm first, you are currently the kind of longest tenured woman in the LCA at this point in time, right? I can't think of anybody else. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Tell me your origin story. Well, I was 25. I was a stringer for 1010 Wins, the very powerful all news station in New York City. And, um, you know, I got here really honestly knowing nothing. <laughs> so I had to learn it all <laughs> from the start. And it was it was fun. It's the thing I love about the Capitol, it's, it's definitely a very sink or swim beat. You either figure out how to make it or you don't. And somehow, I guess I was desperate enough to figure out how to how to do it at least adequately. But one of the things <laughs> I was thinking about, because you were asking me about the early days when in our preparation for this interview, you were asking me about, you know, the what was it like? What was the atmosphere like in the, the yeah? What was the culture days? What was the culture? Well, I was thinking that what first came to mind is the issue of uh, sexual harassment. And one of the first things that I was told when I got here by one of the older women who worked here, that there was one assemblyman that she said, watch out for him. If he comes after you, go hide in the women's bathroom. That was the only advice that you were given in those days about, you know, an out of control man who might, you know, harass or, you know, inappropriately touch a woman. Wow, that that's not a lot to to inspire confidence. <laughs> I don't know, that's just it's, kind of it was. But you know, I I like adopted kind of a hard-edged attitude and nothing ever really happened to me. Yeah, I was going to say did you experience any of that like head on? Well, I mean, it wasn't that bad. There was only a few that would act overtly <laughs> in that particular way. But yeah, it was like something that was accepted, but it, but it, there was no idea that you might speak out against it or that someone might help you, uh, you know, so that was very different. Now, how did the other male reporters that you were, you know, working with or working around, I guess, like, did they perpetuate that kind of man's world attitude? Were you ignored? Were you mentored? Like, how, what was the scene with them? They didn't really. You know, I was lucky because I was the second generation of women who kind of rose to prominence in the, the state mm. capital beats. There was a number of women, maybe 10, 12 years older than me, and they already had been bureau chiefs of the then uh, UPI, AP, not the Times Union, but the afternoon uh, sister paper, uh, Knickerbocker News. So there was a precedent for that. And I'm really grateful for that, that I didn't have to be one of the first. So it was something that, you know, was accepted. And I wouldn't even say grudgingly accepted. It was it was considered okay. They were colleagues. But, you know, I felt like 
I did have to earn people's respect. And I think it's that kind of beat for men or women. You're not just accepted as, you know, a smart or competent person. You have to really show that over a long period of time and many deeds and acts. So there was still an uphill battle to climb, but it wasn't oppressive, outwardly oppressive every day. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was fun. The first governor that I covered here was Mario Cuomo. And I have to say, he really set a tone. He never Mm -hmm. acted inappropriately toward women that I ever saw, never got a vibe Mm -hmm. from him like certain other um, politicians. I felt like maybe sometimes he could be a little patronizing in a fatherly way, like I was the little pet radio reporter. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, at the time, I, I was grateful that that, that was a, a governor that I had to cover other, you know, compared to some other um, politicians that, you know, really did seem pretty troublesome to women. Sure. Now, I don't mean to fast forward too quickly through your career, but you did mention Mario Cuomo and, and his sort of tenor. But you get his son, you know, uh, 30 years later, which, you know, we all know how that went. <laughs> right. I wasn't what... going to say that outright, the comparing the son <laughs> to the father, but certainly we know that Andrew Cuomo resigned last August in a sexual harassment scandal. You know, I find it sad to think that while my experience, you know, in recent decades has been very good here, that there are many, many young women in this building who worked in the governor's office one floor below us reporters who say that they didn't have that experience at all and that they were harassed and belittled and worked in a toxic environment. Would you see yourself as a mentor to to younger you know, female journalists, I fully admit that I believe that you have truly been a mentor to me, but <laughs> have you seen yourself yeah. that way? You know, like kind of coming full circle from the the young cub radio reporter to where you are now. Well, I try to be nice to the young women. I, and I have to admit this, I don't always feel like the older women here when I started were that nice to me. They just had okay. to like put up a front all the time. Mm -hmm. And that extended to me. And so I've sort of gone out of my way to try to be nice to the younger people here because, you know, why not? You're all going to take over one of these days soon. So we might as well be nice. But um, but yeah, I definitely try to do that. And like, you know, now these days in the LCA, it is mostly women. So it's totally different. That doesn't even I don't even have to like put the lifeline out to like the lone young woman who is starting in the beat. So that has totally changed. Well, maybe maybe if there's enough of you, you can all retake that bathroom in the, in the LCA and transform it into a women's bathroom. I know. You, you've had, you know, nearly four decades, six different administrations, you said. And now, today, we have New York's first female governor. We have, you know, the, the um, Senate majority leader is female. The future is female. You know, what is it like covering this administration? And, you know, what are you feeling Governor Hochul is certainly much different than Governor Cuomo. And I, and the difference is, I'm not really sure, are completely gender-based. I mean, Governor mm-hmm. Cuomo and his aides, um, there was always a lot of drama, feuding, you know, bullying of reporters, um, obsessing about everything that we wrote on our news sites, you know, especially the headlines. You'd get a call just trying to get you to change the, the headline if they didn't like mm-hmm. it. And with Hochul, there's just such an absence of that drama. She's just Hmm. very straightforward. I mean, how she appears and the things that you might see on TV or read about in the newspaper, it's really kind of how she is. There isn't like a lot of backstage dramatics going Hmm. on. I don't don't think she's accessible as I'd like her to be. And maybe Hmm. every journalist feels like they want... Um, the person they cover to be more accessible are their aides. I mean, sometimes her aides don't get back to us. She doesn't answer a ton of questions. But mm-hmm. I, I do feel like, you know, there's, a, there's a, a level of common courtesy there that we haven't seen in a decade in this mm-hmm. in this place. And just because she's a woman governor and, you know, personally, I, I want to see, you know, it's, it's fun to see a woman governor. I still feel like I'm not going to give her a break just because she's the first woman governor. Sure. So I try to, you know, really keep up the standards and in, in covering her and, you know, putting her to the to the hard tests. So at any point in your career, you know, in the LCA, did you ever feel explicitly at a disadvantage because you were a woman? Not explicitly. I think there was some times where I felt like 
Um, I wouldn't get called on in press conferences. Mm-hmm. And a couple of times I do have to admit I was crass enough to play the woman card. Um, <laughs> and I said, oh, are you going to call on a woman? Where all my colleagues did not like that at all. Although oh, I boy. think that probably younger women today would have no problem saying that. <laughs> Sure, <laughs> but, sure. Um, wow. But no, not complete. No, I, I, I wouldn't. I think that this is a place where there is some equity among the reporters that if, you know, if you just keep plugging away at your job and, mm-hmm. you know, show up for things and don't miss the big stories, I think that you can earn respect no matter who you are. We talked to several more women in the LCA about their experiences for a recent issue of Upstate Business. Check out their perspectives, too, at timesunion.com. After the break, HBO's new series, The Gilded Age, premiered this week. And one of its stars is a Slingerlands native. We'll talk to actress Kelly Curran about her role in the show and what it was like seeing Troy featured on the small screen. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union. Join us for an ongoing discussion on major developments in the saga of Keith Raniere, co-founder of Nexium, the shadowy upstate New York organization at the center of the explosive federal investigation that resulted in Raniere's conviction on charges of extortion, sex trafficking, and more. We talk to former members of Nexium, discuss the latest news, and preview the likely next twists in this bizarre and disturbing story. You can find Nexium on trial at timesunion.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. Last summer, downtown Troy was whizzed back in time to the 1880s. Dirt roads replaced asphalt, horse-drawn carriages crisscrossed Monument Square, and bustles and top hats were the height of fashion. The HBO series The Gilded Age had used the Collar City as a backdrop to recreate late 19th century New York. New York is a collection of villages. The old have been in charge since before the revolution, until the new people invaded. Now, the historical drama penned by Downton Abbey creator Julian Fellows follows the lives of upper crust New Yorkers and their downstairs servants enmeshed in Gilded Age society, navigating the impacts of a rapidly changing world. Cynthia Nixon and Christine Baranski headline a star-studded cast decked out in colorful period costumes. And among those players is Kelly Curran, who plays the ambitious ladies' maid Turner. The mistress is not a player in the great game. Curran grew up in Slingerlands. She was thrilled to learn that part of the show was to be filmed in her native capital region. Reporter Ken Crow recently spoke with her on the phone from New York about the show's premiere and her experience filming it. Here is some of their conversation. You didn't film here in Troy at all, did you? No, I did not, actually. I wrapped up filming um, in Newport, Rhode Island, which we finished right before we came to Troy. But it was a a really nice excuse to to come up and spend some time with my family and pop over and see what they were doing with production in Troy. You know, I, I've looked at your resume, and you have a lot of mm-hmm. Shakespearean drama in your uh, your past, uh, mm-hmm. and not much television or film. So mm-hmm. in this this role, you're jumping right in. How did you like playing Turner? I sort of fell in love with her right away, like right when I got sent the materials for the audition. Um, when we meet her, she's she's at this moment in her life where her life is not turning out as she expected, and I think mm-hmm. not as she hoped. And she's reached this point where that could either really embitter her or it could inspire her to action. And I just think it's such a delicious moment to meet this character on this particular precipice and um, explore what she's going to do. But that's so much of the genius of, um, of Julian's writing and Sonia Warfield's writing is that almost all of these characters that we meet in the show are, are on 
on a kind of personal precipice in their life because the world is changing so rapidly and so radically in the industrial age around them that it, it's challenging so much of what they thought they knew about life and its rules. So yeah, I just I just fell in love with Turner even for all of her um, shadows, <laughs> if that's the right word, you know. I think that's very. Um, I don't know that I would behave similarly to Turner if I were in her position, but but you know that's not my thing to judge. I just have to try to understand her and love her. So you didn't film in Troy, but your mom told me that you, she, your sister, and your then new uh, nephew checked yeah. everything out. So how was it to be in Troy to see the cityscape transformed? Uh, for the uh, production you, you would be in, even though you were sort of like a, it was almost like a busman's holiday, I would think. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. No, it was so exciting. Again, it was it was so lovely because it was such a lovely excuse to come up and visit my family, which, you know, I've, I've been very lucky that I've been able to kind of safely split time between uh, the city and, and Slingerland, seeing them over the course of the last couple of years. And, and to have the world collide like that, the thing that I've been working on throughout the whole pandemic, um, come into their sphere was so exciting. And, um, you know, when I first learned that we'd be filming some of the show in Troy, I was so excited because it it felt very full circle. You know, it's very um, a meaningful thing to me. I kept thinking of that, um, that proverb, you know, the, the longest way around is the shortest way home. Right. I have sort of thinking about that and the gift it is to be able to come back and work um, where I grew up all these years later. And then it was so thrilling to to see how our, um, you know, production design team just like took what the city already has to offer and brought it to this imaginative world of the 1880s. Um, because I think, you know, when you're a local somewhere, you grow up somewhere, it's very easy to take for granted the singularity of a place and like the distinctive beauty of a place when you see it every day. And so then to see it through, through the eyes of people who were imagining it as it, as it was, you know, like 140 years ago or 50 years ago, it was really such a joy and a joy too, especially that they use the, you know, the Troy Savings Bank music hall for some of the filming because I performed there once in high school as like part of like a regional <laughs> high school choir concert, you know, and that was my oh. first experience of the music hall it was like, I think it must've been like 2000 or 2001 singing in the choir there. And we were told, you know, this place is acoustically perfect. It's such a privilege to get to sing here. And then, you know, in the years since I've um, gone to see shows there and I just love that space. And so then to have sort of the full circle of, of uh, having the show come back and film there was really special it was all really special and i hope it was a joy for the town too it was exciting to especially after the pandemic and all the isolation and you know to to be able to arrive at the town at at a moment when you know the vaccine rollout had started and and -hmm. and the warm weather was happening and things were starting to come to life i think it felt very joyous so i hope it was for for the people of troy too i hope it was uh kind of fun just to have that much like lifeblood all of a sudden show up in town, at, you know, halfway through a pandemic. I hope it was at least, um, you know, a sort of enlivening experience for everybody. They're looking forward to season two. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Though I know officially good. there's no word on that. So. Right, right, yes. Yeah. But I would be too. I would be too. If we get word, I will definitely look forward to it. So you, so you didn't actually film anything in Troy yourself? No, no, so I did not. I, 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 mm-hmm. You, you wish you had. Um. Yeah. I mean, it would have been fun too, but it also really was just very satisfying to be able to pop over and see everybody at work there from the other side. Um. Because I think because I've done just a couple other things in television, I've never spent as much concentrated time working in television as I have since, since starting this show. Um. It's also been really fascinating to me to to learn about television production this is a lot of like absorbing um vocabulary and and a sort of process that i was less familiar with in the moment and so what was really fun about being able to pop over um to troy when when my part was done when i could sort of let go of mm-hmm. turner and let go of the pressure of performance and just watch observe the other side of the filming and and um how they did it and these the large scenes that were filmed in Troy, like at the Opera House and 
and also the much more intimate scenes, like the different smaller family scenes that were filmed in Troy too. I was able to sort of pop over and and be on the other side of it for for a, for a little bit, and that was uh, sort of just as exciting as as any of the filming I got to do myself, because it's really an astonishing team of people on this show. I mean, every single department is just filled with people who are just sort of the top, the top of the industry in terms of what they do, um, production design, costume design, hair and makeup, uh, the directors, the historic, um, the historians on the show. I mean, it's, it's, it's really such a privilege and to just watch everyone work all together to make, such a large show. The scope of the show is so large, you know, so many characters, so many different events, and mm-hmm. and to watch them all make it come to life um, during a pandemic and keep us all safe was really um, was really uh, astonishing. So I'm, it was nice What's... to be a witness to it in Troy. Well, we all know that the city of Troy is the real star of the show here. Were you able to see it in the backdrop of the Gilded Age? I haven't seen the first episodes yet, but I am looking forward to watching. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. Special thanks this week to Casey Seiler and Ken Crow for their contribution to this episode.